Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as toxic stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert. In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. Stress is just activating your limbic system, your fear, your flight or flight reflex, you're pumping up an effort into your blood, your heart is racing, you're ready to go, and it's actually a helpful thing. We're glad we have a stress response because with all those things happening, adrenaline in your blood, it does help you meet many crises. You're more focused, you're ready to, to do that. A little harder for babies to use that adrenaline, but we're built to have it. So it facilitates attachment. Well, I already said that, stress and stress relief is facilitating. So that's called positive stress. The Harvard people sort of break stress up into three things, positive stress or normal stress or hey, it doesn't hurt us, but it's not bad as long as we can manage it. But then you have stress that is significant. Nobody's going to say Katrina is positive stress, but it's manageable if you have somebody connected to you. Death of a parent is manageable if you have someone connected to you. Not that it won't always affect you, but it doesn't have to impinge on your mental health if you have other connected people around you that can buffer that. stress that's really bad for maybe longer, attachment can really be an important thing and prevent it from being toxic. So again, we need to build those attachments. And then stress that there's no attachments, nobody connected, that is what toxic stress is. It's going to build into your brain because you don't have anything to buffer that. We don't have a measure of all that buffering, but we know that kids that are connected do much better after almost any trauma. As long as they're not traumatized by their people that are uh, connected to, which is the doubly bad because you're losing your connection at the same time you're having trauma, but um, any kid that has connections is going to be safer and better from all kinds of trauma. So it can go on a long time, and in fact it can be sort of built into concert high alert. I mentioned that LC maybe was still on high alert. His limbic system is just always afraid of everything that's hard to develop when you have that happen. So avoiding relationships with aggression is one of the outcomes. You know, kids do that all the time. I don't want a relationship, it was too painful. But also temper tantrums, you know, having trouble connecting, isolating yourself, avoiding relationships, I'm just not gonna connect. We define reactive attachment disorder as not making any connectedness to, to people. The DSM-5 has clarified that a little bit, that it's not kind of two things, they gave a different name, but it's basically they cannot attach because of what happened to them. And, or they do bad behaviors or behaviors that are gonna harm them because it's self-medicating or it's somehow changing their brain to feel a little bit better. Not everybody that smokes is doing this because obviously there are lots of smokers, but 
kids that do have trauma are much more likely to smoke, so you know, both things are true. Alcohol and drugs, you know, not everybody who drinks is drinking to cause some pain because you can drink for just some other reasons. You're in college and you're binge drinking, you know, you can, you can start tripping away at your receptors and you can become addicted even if you don't have the childhood reason to do that, but we know it, it increases. HMOs have lots of data about people, and Kaiser Permanente was one of the early big HMOs. They had a lot of data about personal history. They knew what happened to all the people they're taking care of, and they knew about their health outcomes. They knew how often they had to play for a triple bypass. And so they just thought, let's just look at both of them. This is research, and they defined, they had 17,000 participants, pretty big sample. They knew about personal history, and they defined 10 childhood experiences, three kinds of abuse, two kinds of neglect. We'd all agree that those are adverse childhood experiences. Household things like domestic violence or mental illness in the, in the household or substance abuse in the household, and then separation or divorce or incarceration. Those also are difficult for, for kids. And this is just how often 36% of those 70,000 had none of those, but 26% had one and another 16% had two, so it's unlikely to have four or more, but those that had four or more had lots more problems. They measured all of these things, and I guess I'll, this is the list of things they measured that are strongly related to the number of ACE score things. And it's graded response, so if you have twice as many of those, you're gonna have more of this thing. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you wouldn't think, well, okay, well, we know it's related to smoking because the smoking's on there, early smoking is on there. Uh, ischemic heart disease, you know, coronary arteries that are giving you problems, well, we know that's related to a lot of things. Smoking again, alcoholism, liver disease, suicide attempts and depression, all those are graded and related to how many of these you have. The middle one is kind of health behaviors, you know, we know those are related partner violence, domestic violence, fetal death, early sexual, lots of sexual risk factors. So those are all strongly related. Just as an example, this is one of the references I gave you, and this is the Garner's, it's just a set of slides that he did a talk uh, for the American Academy of Pediatrics. So this is current smoking. Out of those 17,000 people, 18% of them had early smoking and, and people who don't have any, 6% did strong relationship, graded relationship between lung cancer and those ACEs. Well, that makes sense because the thing, but also dying young from cancer, particularly strong for those who died young from their lung cancer, strong that they had ACE, high ACE scores. But that only partly was accounted for by their smoking. So from this data, there's clearly other things from ACE experience that makes you more likely to have cancer and it's not just because it makes you smoke. Maybe it's your immune system that's not as good and so you're more likely. There's any number of things that we just don't know exactly, but it's important to think, let's not write this all off as, oh, it just goes to health behaviors. It, it's a lot. Well, here's another health behavior, alcoholism. Look at how strong that is. The, the adjusted risk factor is seven times, so having that is essentially gives you a seven times the risk if you don't have it. This is, uh, this is an IV drug use, a, a very high risk, especially in four or more. At the very least, we need to protect the establishment of continued adult-child relationships, and that should be our highest priority probably in every aspect. Everything we're doing, we should ask, is this helping adults in this kid's life attach better to them? It doesn't matter what you're doing, we just have to do that because it's protective. I have a video that I put on there that I won't have time to show, but about neglect, just the science of neglect. Because neglect and toxic stress are kind of related. Toxic stress is a big stress that isn't buffered, but neglect is, isn't buffered, so even a little stress might be toxic. So if you have neglect, you're not going to make good connections and you're going to be at risk. Recognizing and responding to children and adults who have experienced toxic stress will allow effective interventions. 
Well, there's not a magic screening exactly, but the history is very important, you know. Has this kid had losses in his family? Is there, is there abuse or neglect, or is it even possible? Do we have any indication? Uh, all those ACEs, you know, that's just a quick, the ones that they picked out to look at it, it at Kaiser, but it's a good list of things we want to look for. And then when we're doing functional behavioral analysis, just go a step further and say, is what this kid's communicating something very much harder or bigger than just, like is it avoiding people all, in, all together? Because then you're not going to do just a little functional behavioral intervention where, oh, well, let's teach him to communicate his need to avoid people. <laughs> you have to get you know, a therapist involved. Functional behavior analysis and behavior mod modification work, but they're not adequate to deal with it. So we're batting our head against the wall if we're trying to uh, condition a kid not to do something that he's doing because his brain has been damaged. Doesn't mean behavior modification is not good. It's a very effective matter. It works for kids with attention deficit. It helps, but it's not going to get at that deeper issue. Consistent repetitive loving care are the necessary conditions for preventing toxic stress and the best intervention.